this uh, year, I registered in 2009, I think winter of 2009, uh, and then started uh, his PhD right after that uh, in summer of 2009. And uh, he's here now to defend his uh, PhD dissertation. Uh, the topic today of his talk is a semantic situation awareness framework for indoor cyber physical system. And I'd like to thank all of you for being here, especially the committee members. And uh, now I'm going to hand over to, oh, by the way, just ground rules. Uh, I will ask him to take, not take more than 50 minutes. Uh, I think that's the, probably the attention span of most of us. Um, and so after that, uh, and by the way, if you can hold your question till the end, so that he can, he has quite a bit to talk about, so uh, let's not uh, interrupt his talks. Uh, and then uh, after that, we'll have an open defense. All of you uh, welcome to ask questions. And then after we're done with that, I'll request you to leave and uh, give a chance to the committee member uh, to further ask questions. And after that, after they, as ask the question, uh, then we'll ask him to leave uh, and then discuss uh, uh, the situation and decide what we're going to do. Okay, so go ahead. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Dr. Ratan introduced me, uh, me I'm Pr Pratik Desai. Uh, I'm candidate uh, of uh, PhD in engineering, and uh, today I'll be defending my uh, PhD work. So the topic is the topic for my dissertation is semantic situation awareness framework for indoor cyber physical system. It's uh, kind of difficult to go through the entire research I have done throughout my PhD in 50 minutes, but I will try my best to cover. So in some slide, I may go a little faster. So before I start anything, I would like to first introduce the, the domain cyber physical system. Uh, so everyone know embedded system. So like all the small sensor connected with the microprocessor, that's like a pretty mature domain. But with the technological developments in a wireless and networking technology, uh, we saw uh, wireless sensor network in our recent years. But now, as we see, the internet is becoming a kind of de facto standard to all the sensor devices we use. Uh, it's, uh, now everything or all the sensors are connected to the internet or people are trying to connect to the internet. And the domain of cyber physical system is uh, the, the pre, uh, successor of the network embedded system we see. So that's the cyber physical system. Uh, by formal definition, the cyber physical system have control, communication, and computation. These three components tightly couple with the cyber and the physical world. So that's uh, so the, this is a pretty uh, new domain. So there are no fixed uh, definition, but this is one of the formal definition of cyber physical system. Now, some of the examples in a, uh, recent times are traffic management system, like a city-wide traffic management system. All the cameras are connected to through internet to an operator, uh, air traffic control, uh, smart grid to save energy, but we are focusing on the indoor applications, uh, disaster management, smart house, uh, remote patient monitoring. So in cyber physical, we are focusing on the uh, subset of indoor cyber physical system. Now, what is our motivation behind uh, the situation awareness, developing a situation awareness framework? So, I would start with a scenario of a small indoor environment. I would like to explain the scenario because I will use this scenario later on throughout the, the presentation because we are using as a as an example in uh, our dissertation. So in an indoor environment, there is a fireplace in the building. There is a fire, chair on fire. And there are some unknown, unknown sources or unknown people or objects inside the room which are not known to our knowledge, like what the background knowledge. In of the mobile sensing platform, which is going through this environment, trying to collect the sensor information. So what we are trying to detect is a situation, the actual fire at the chair. 
but we have two different fire events or entity is going one at the fireplace one at the chair and we are detecting that with the temperature and the carbon dioxide sensor being obtained from the mobile sensing platform now what are the challenges so as we know the sensors on the any sensor we use to uh, measure the environmental uh, phenomenon will not always give you a crisp and consistent answer there are problems with the resolution of the sensors uh, limit, uh, cal the calibration problem uh, robustness of the sensors so there are uncertainty associated with the sensor data obtained from the sensors and uh, unknown unknown sources in the environment which are not part of the knowledge we have for this uh, situation of NS application. So these are the two basic challenges we are trying to solve. And then when we are talking about the cyber physical system, it's not just a one indoor environment. There can be multiple indoor environment with different entities to detect and but they still uh, there are they are still indoor environment and some operator outside like a fire uh, like a fire department or healthcare de healthcare or the hospital trying to access this different environment and trying to come up with a situation so in that case we need interoperability between this indoor environment we need to provide some kind of system or a framework which will provide interoperability between this environments now as we know it's indoor we cannot use gps it, it will not we it will not provide it will not provide uh, accurate results for indoor environment so we need to develop a something for indoor location awareness now as we can see there are lots of uh, indoor environment lots of uh, events happening lots of objects lot of context it's a complex system so a basic if and else rules based approach we people use in the embedded system may not work or may not be a scalable approach so we need to solve that too so these are the challenges or the why we are trying to uh, we what why we are doing this research now before i start uh, go to the next step i would like to define some of the some of the concepts on the terminology we i i will use throughout the presentation and we use in the dissertation like the context the context may have different meaning for but for the cyber physical system systems and our dissertation we are defining context as a <coughs> as a physical phenomenon uh, observed from the sensors and its product of an event happening inside the environment now location is also a type of context and environmental context so what we did we said okay the location is one type of context and every every other environmental phenomenon like a temperature carbon dioxide carbon dioxide heart rate will will uh, classify that those as environmental context because what we are trying to do over here is we are trying to achieve the contextual situation awareness using the environmental context so this contextual situation awareness part using a mobile robot will measure this uh, environmental context identify the situation and then use the lo location awareness the look the spatial information of the sources or where this uh, context source are being collected to further discriminate between the entities or the events we are going to identify so now so uh, uh, like now I would, sum, I would like to summarize uh, the entire approach pretty quickly and then go uh, in a deep for each and every step so the first step is collect the raw sensor data from sensors on a mobile platform and collect the raw spatial information from uh, some indoor positioning system use this uh, raw environmental sensor uh, data to convert in the high level abstractions of events or entities such as fire or presence of a room heater or presence of dry highs in the environment and use uh, raw spatial information find out which object it's related to and use the object and the entity relationship to come up with the situation so that's like a framework now in the pyramid form, uh, the contextual this is the contextual situation of an aspar as it works it uh, deals with the environmental context. So we have the raw sensor data from environment. We first convert into lower level abstractions. Lower level abstractions means okay, it's a high temperature or the low temperature, high carbon dioxide. Use those uh, quant uh, qualities. We call them qualities to reason for the high level abstractions. It's like okay, fire, dry ice presence of a room heater 
And similarly for the location awareness part, we start with the obtaining the just the distance information, convert them into the coordinates because we are dealing with the indoor. So we are also we are trying to model Cartesian coordinates and then use this distance to find out which are the objects this sensor data is being obtained and then use this object and relationship to further discriminate and find uh, efficient situation. So that's our whole approach. Now these are, there are three steps, I'll, or three, three contribution of the research which I'll go through now. First is this contextual situation awareness, finding the indoor location, and then modeling this indoor location in such a way we can discriminate for the situation. So the first contribution or the first part is the contextual situation awareness. Use mobile robot, get the environmental context, and find the events in the room. So to do that first, uh, Hansen, uh, uh, Corey Hansen in a uh, NOESIS, uh, Ohio Center of Excellence in uh, Knowledge and Naval Computing, uh, they developed the Interlego framework for machine perception. Uh, so this, this framework actually uses abductive reasoning and a crisp uh, reasoning approach to uh, obtain raw sensor data, derive quality, and explain entities or the events from these qualities. So we use this as a stepping stone for solving the uncertainty and incomplete domain knowledge problems. So in this Intelligo approach, which we are, we are using as a, as a, a base, uh, <coughs> the quality type is actually the context type, so temperature and the carbon dioxide. The qualities are derived from this uh, crisp range, <coughs> 200 low temperature, 100 to above 100 high temperature, similar for carbon dioxide. And now, with abductive is from, uh, uh, because of abductive reasoning approach, or by the way, abductive reasoning approach, now we will say that a high temperature inheres in quality, or the fire explains the high temperature, and the high temperature will uh, provide information about the fire and the room heater. So instead of having the rule which say, okay, fire is only possible, or fire is only detected when you have high temperature and high carbon dioxide, instead we are saying, okay, whenever you have high temperature, you can have fire and room heater, Whenever there is low carbon dioxide, you can have a room heater and normal condition. And using these two, we say, okay, now the subset will say, okay, the room heater. Now, the, the, the good thing about this approach is whenever there is one sensor not in loop or because of some sensor error or the data loss, if one sensor day res uh, results you don't get, still because of the high temperature, you will say, okay, you know, there are two entities can be there. So this is the, but now, you can see there are crisp threshold based approach. So what, when there is a thousand and ten, uh, thousand ten particles per million uh, carbon dioxide in 500 centigrade. Using the interlego, we will find out, okay, there is a fire with full certainty because that's a, with the, it deals with the crisp approach. So you can have fire with the full trust, like there will be fire or no fire. But when there is a 999 ppm, now this can be results of so when we simulated using Interlego in our laboratory, what happened whenever like you walk to the mobile robot or the sensor because of the carbon dioxide you exhale, which are which is not model in the our domain knowledge, you get this uh, variations in the carbon dioxide results. So we our exhale carbon dioxide was not model in the domain knowledge, and similarly that can be because of the calibration problem in the carbon dioxide. So how how we solve this thing? So, as we know, uh, these are the problems. As we know, uh, the Zadeh introduced the fuzzy logic concept in 1965. Now, the fuzzy do not deal with the crisp, uh, crisp approach. So, the, 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 fu uh, the fuzzy approach will provide you that if, if observation or an object in, 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 in a set with a degree of truth, so in the crisp approach, it, it will be there in the set or it will not be. It, it can exit or it cannot. But in fuzzy, it can be there but with the certainty or the certainty degree of between 0 to 1. So uh, from over here you can see the, the crisp, uh, crisp instead of having crisp uh, uh, abstraction, we said okay, there is a fuzzy, fuzzy range between 800 and 12, between 800 and 1200 uh, particles per million for carbon dioxide. Now, this data uh, are obtained from a domain expert, 
and we are using for uh, as an example and this is uh, yeah, this is uh, something not scope in not in scope of our research we are we have we said okay we are getting it from some of our development experts so when there is an observation a in between this fuzzy region it can be it, it will be part of uh, high carbon dioxide it will be also part of low carbon dioxide abstraction but it will be with a different degree of truth so in the crease we said okay it will be only carbon dioxide low or carbon dioxide high but now the observation a is in both abstractions with different certainty uh, degree and in fuzzy logic we, uh, it is denoted as a mu membership function so now if we go uh, we, we take the domain knowledge from the crisp approach and fuzzify this abstraction now what we are doing we, we are introducing the fuzzy set or the fuzzy abstraction in the previous approach and now we have we fuzzified the the the, content, uh, the qualities abstractions so the the reasoning is still same uh, so the the reasoning approach is still still same but as we are using the fuzzy set we are calling it fuzzy abductive reasoning and so now for this example the certainty of fire so we will uh, we'll still identify the fire from high temperature and say high carbon dioxide context but the the certainty uh, certainty or of the fire will be calculated using this certainty high temperature which is one over here and certainty of high carbon dioxide which will be something 0.9 because of this and that's how we'll have 0.9 certainty so in a, in an equation form we'll say okay because the high carbon dioxide and the low carbon dioxide observation is in both both sets we'll use all this uh, entities be explained from the high carbon dioxide low carbon dioxide and then this is from the <coughs> temperature and we from equation we have earlier we had just fire now we had fire and room heater so there are two different events we are finding out from the same results now the certainty of the fire and certainty of the room heater are calculated using the fuzzy minimum function uh, and so what we have now is we have said okay with the same results earlier where we had just fire now we have fire with 0.9 certainty and we have room heater with 0.1 certainty so it's a more logical explanation of the results we obtained because earlier even with a little bit of variation in the temperature because of the uncertainty in sensor data or the incompleteness of domain knowledge this uh, this uh, the variations were compromised now we are actually giving some logical explanation to the variation so what we did for a 50 point in the inner room we moved a, robot, a mobile robot with carbon dioxide and temperature sensors and obtained results and use the crisp approach and the fuzzy approach so as you can see these are the two points this is where the uh, uh, the chair was and this is where the fireplace was and we wanted to find only the fire entity so this is the light blue is the truth now with the uh, crisp approach this is how we obtain uh, with the certainty of one or zero for results and oh, as you can see over here with the fuzzy instead of just getting always the uh, one certainty we had some results with different certainty values and with this the accuracy precision and the recall of, of the overall entity identification was improved significantly compared to the crisp approach so that's how let's say we we have now the solution or we are proposing a step toward uh, obtaining a solution to uh, deal with these uncertainties now after this approach uh, we uh, we also uh, we also said that there are two different other challenges interoperability between systems and the when what do you do with when you have a complex system now for two sensors i guess uh, you can write the same uh, basic rules for like uh, in a code but i guess when you have a big complex system i think it's, we should use uh, some uh, standardized format so we choose the semantic web so the semantic web in a in the world world wide web it's defined to form for formally uh, to formalize the meaning of information on on, on the internet and uh, it's provide expressive representation and the re reasoning mechanism and also the the semantic web provide a standard standards standard framework so uh, if you are using some uh, those same framework on different uh, platform 
it become more e like it's convenient in it's also provide interoperability and the ontology is the way of representing the the knowledge now the uh, the semantic web use rdf uh, uh, language to model the information and in the rdf uh, the resources are described with a subject predicate and object uh, this uh, relation semantic so if the uh, this quality high temperature is connected with the fire event with inherence in quality so this is how every object we de describe early like from quality type to quality quality quantity can be described with a different property so in in the in the semantic web part uh, in the semantic web uh, modeling what we did first we obtained the raw sensor data use this ssn ontology ssn ontology been developed by the world wide web as a standard to uh, describe uh, sensor sensor resources sensor observation and the ssn annotated data was converted you in the uh, the qualities or uh, the fuzzy uh, low level fuzzy abstraction using the domain ontology the domain ontology has the uh, re, uh, description of the temperature and the carbon dioxide all those qualities and the fuzzification tools that was the observation process and the, uh, from using this quality we used that fuzzy adaptive reasoning to come up with the higher level abstraction in terms of entity so that was the modeling part now let's say after this contextual situation awareness from the sensors inside the room we have uh, two place we have fire entities and room temperature fire and room temperature but now we know that the fire at the fireplace it's not applicable or it is something we already know and we should only focus on the fire at the chair so how how we deal with that or how we find solution so first step toward obtaining that is op is obtaining uh, accurate uh, location information of the of the object or the mobile sensor so as we as i said the gps gps which is very standard for location based services outside outdoor is not useful for indoor and we also need a very accurate indoor location algorithm now there are rf some rf based algorithm radio frequency based algorithm which are not that accurate in terms of uh, identifying small objects and mobile robots or a person or a patient and then there, there are camera based approaches this camera based approaches are very expensive and they require a lot of processing and image processing to identify or the locate an object now as we say the the cyber physical system is a success a successor of wireless sensor network why don't we use a wireless sensor network based approach to identify the location so we choose the a wireless sensor network based approach using time difference of arrival method to find the location so uh, keeping this uh, cyber physical concept alive we are using cyber wireless sensor network now what is time difference of arrival so in the time difference of arrival we have two different like the first type of time difference of arrival is find distance use distance to find location and location we will use for the for the discrimination of entity so uh, in the wireless sensor network the sensor nodes are actually called modes and the modes which are mounted on a ceiling or the uh, the modes which have static location they are called beacons and the one which are on the mobile platform or the patient or the robot are called listeners so uh, to find the distance the beacons which which behave as a pseudo satellite they transmit ultrasonic and rf signal together to the listener the listener receives those signal but as we know rf is very very fast than the ultrasonic so the timer will start when it receive the rf signal and wait till the ultrasonic signal is received we will calculate the delta t for the ultrasonic and the ultra speed of ultrasonic is also known so with the delta t into uh, speed of ultrasonic we will have the distance between beacon and listener so from the tdo and now we have the the distance then we use trilateration to identify the location using this distance is we calculated because the location of the beacon are known so with trilateration we can find out the location of the object now before i go to the algorithm we proposed what what was the problem in this time difference of arrival if there is something over here which block the ultrasonic you won't be able to get the the distance because the ultrasonic cannot pass through or even if it go and bounce back to the from the wall the time will be increased and the you will not get the accurate distance so 
we get to first uh, find a solution to solve this problem of uh, line of sight. And then also the, this uh, approach had a problem with uh, the frequency rate. So if uh, we have a mobile robots moving inside the room, we need a higher frequency. So for that, we proposed an algorithm and simulated it. In this, we are using the radio frequency and time difference of arrival, a fusion of them, and use the extensive training of the RF signal to find the loss factor in the environment. So using the training of this uh, uh, radio signal strength uh, or receive signal strength, we find the loss factor and use that to identify the distance and then use this distance with trial iteration to go for the localization. And this algorithm actually work in absence uh, in the absence of line of sight because whenever there is no line of sight, you use this loss, loss factor, use the RF and uh, find the distance. So to, to test, what we did is we fix a, we set up, uh, we set up an environment. In the environment, we had the four beacon at a fixed location. We know their position. We know distance between them and we know their position. And then we run our training algorithm. So earlier, only there was one communication between beacon to listener. Everywhere, every other beacon used to wait till that turn comes. But now in the, in the proposed algorithm, what we are doing is we are, uh, all the beacons have a RS, a radio signal strength uh, uh, table, and every time any beacon transmit or the broadcast the signal, everyone listen, uh, find their receive signal strength, and populate their table. And this process continue whenever every beacon uh, transmit the data. Now, as I said earlier, the distance between them were known. So that's why this R14 between B1 and B14 we know the distance, we have the radio, uh, we have the, uh, the receive signal strain between these two, and now we have these uh, parameters for all these beacons. And so with this uh, uh, training, now we have this loss factor, and then we use this loss factor to find out distance and continue the previous process of find, using trial iteration and go to the position. So. Uh, we simulated this algorithm and we, uh, we, uh, we obtained uh, consistent uh, results and the, the results were similar to the TDOA approach in terms of accuracy. And so now, now in that three step I described contextual situation awareness and location awareness, we have now the, the location part. Now how you use this raw location to find out which object it is. So now I have 300, 200, 100 in XYZ coordinates. Even for a human or operator to, and uh, operator by, by using his cognitive ability and say, okay, this 300, 200, and 100 XYZ is this chair. That's that be very <coughs> difficult. And when you're getting lots of raw sensor data, you need to develop a, a, a method where the operator will direct, will see that, okay, whenever that this is the, raw XYZ, that means he is talking about the chair, or it is at the table, or it is at the sofa. So we need to, and we also need to keep continue providing the interoperability. So so if you see this a prototype room, so there, there can be different bedrooms, it can have different uh, objects inside, you can have multiple objects, and this is just one environment, there can be multiple environment. So for that, uh, we introduced in indoor location ontology. So in that one, we said, okay, uh, these are the three main classes you should have in your, if you if you are using this framework, you should have three main classes. The point of interest, which represent objects, structural components, which are the rooms or the corridors, and the entities, which are the events for that application, like for the focus application. So you can have all these uh, objects uh, describe as a POI, as a subclass of the point of interest, and whenever you have extra chairs, you you say, okay, chair one is an individual of chair POI, chair two is an individual of chair, chair POI, and also the rooms, similarly, the rooms can also be uh, described, or the room can be also described as an individual of this room subclass. Now, with the, this uh, uh, frame, how, how you describe an object? So let's say we charged with a chair one. So the chair one is described as an individual of chair POI class and chair POI is a point of interest. And then the chair one is also located inside drawing room one. 
And similarly, with the inverse property, we'll say, okay, the drawing room one has POI chair one, and then drawing room is individual. Of, and now this is the concept I would like to explain. Uh, Slow down. Okay. 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 I slow down. Okay. I'm excited and I like keep going. <laughs> so, so the whenever we are inside this, uh, when we are dealing with the situation of an application, our mobile robot is going through the object. Now, the effective or the coverage area of a fire, like the, it can be, it, it can vary with a different application. For simplicity, for explanatory purpose, we said, okay, all the object we are trying to model in our frame, uh, in, in our uh, framework, will accept cuboid safe as a standard. Now, you know, sometimes the different objects can have different coverage area, but just as explanatory purpose, just to say like, you know, you can have different uh, operational space for different events, but say for our approach, we define cuboid safe and use X, Y, and Z limitation as a data property to define this coverage space of even all the objects, say chair, sofa, fireplace. So this is how the object is uh, uh, modeled. Now, these are the properties in the uh, indoor location ontology. Now say, you received a 195, centimeter X and Y location. Uh, I'm not including Z just to explain this approach. So, uh, all, the, all the point of interest which has X maximum one, one, greater than 190, all the objects which are you know, in this area, subset of all the uh, objects in that area and using this x, y and z limitations these are the objects we found taking the subset and we find okay so this role location is now translated into chair one so if my robot is moving and has this location or my the B listener has this location I would say that's the, the it's at the chair now for now now we had role location we say this is chair from the location. Now we need to define the relationship between the chair and the fire, or say fireplace and the fire. So for that, uh, introduce, we introduce <coughs> the applicable entities. So whenever there is a fire at the fireplace, it's not the part of the situation you would like to provide to the operator, because operator know that the fire at the fireplace is not the situation for the situation awareness application. Uh, similarly, if we, if someone measure lots of, uh, like, increase heart rate or increase perspiration at trade meal, it's not a sign of a heart attack. It's, it's just because of a workout. So we need to model this object and event relationship in that indoor location ontology. And we did with this has applicable. So the, the fireplace can have dries or the normal conditions, but fire or and the uh, room heater we said no it's not uh, it, it is kind of we know that this kind of entity is, is there at the fireplace and the, uh, it's not the information you would like to provide to an operator so they are uh, uh, you know model with this uh, property so for the same experiment we had this uh, robot moved across uh, near the chair to the fireplace and this was the results we obtained from the fuzzy and crisp approach. And as you can see, the, the, the actual situation, which is fire at the chair, that's not part, of the, not part of the situation you would like to provide to the operator. But still, those approaches without location assistance provided like fire, uh, explained fire at this place. With the, the location-aided reasoning approach, now we have eliminated all these entities, uh, you know, earlier explained using the fuzzy reasoning. So now we have a very, very uh, accurate results. And actually, because we use just the 50 points, the precision we obtained using this approach were actually like 100 percent. Like, and even the recalls were really very, like, uh, very, uh, like better, very better than the fuzzy objective and the crisp approach. So what, what I would say with our approach now, we have actually separated two different fires and the fire which is actually good enough or the appropriate 
for the operator we have, we have identified with the certainty number. So the fire at the chair has been identified with 0.9 and 0.1 certainty and now we will provide that information to the operator. So now I need to you know, combine all these uh, components in a one framework. So this is the system level component. So in the system level, we have these two parts which, which are connected with the physical environment, connect the, the location context and the environmental context. Then we have this contextual situation awareness part which use the environmental sensors and identify the entities. And then we have the location <coughs> awareness part which use the location and the object entity relationship to further discriminate between these entities and come up with the final situation. So that's the uh, comprehensive framework. And the, in the semantic uh, modeling framework, this was the part we had in the contextual situation awareness. And this is the part with indoor location ontology. So we use indoor location ontology to first convert raw data into objects and then use object to optimize situation. Now, I'd like to, as I'm going through the comprehensive framework, I would like to explain all these components in a, like a graphical format. So the first component, physical part, collecting the sensor data. We collected this sensor information and the location information were collected like this. And this is the coverage area of fire. Now, we define as a cuboid. So this is the cuboid shape. Now, we use this contextual situation awareness now, instead of temperature and carbon dioxide, we have fire and uh, presence of a room heater with a different certainty number. That's the second part, the situational, uh, contextual situation awareness. And now, use that ontology, indoor ontology, to convert that row location into fire and a chair. Now, in the last part, the, the location-based reason, we discriminated and say, okay, the fireplace, you know, the fire is not the applicable uh, entity at fireplace. So, no, we are not presenting that. So, the, the operator will receive only this part for decision making in the situation awareness application. So, uh, so that's the uh, overall explanation of the entire framework. Now, uh, from our, uh, our contribution, the, for me, uh, the first contribution was to develop this indoor location algorithm to provide the, the rose parcel information. So we, we use cricket modes, cricket wireless sensor network modes, and uh, develop our surveillance and tracking application integrated with the positive user. So this was the part in the indoor location algorithm. Then we introduced the fuzzy abstraction approach in the uh, interlabo framework, and uh, that's the con other contribution. Uh, then use this uh, indoor location ontology, modeling the objects inside the location ontology, and do, uh, introducing the location-based reasoning on the on the fuzzy abstraction approach. And then we also uh, develop this uh, comprehensive framework to uh, to combine all these components and come up with the actual uh, situation. So in the future work, as I said, the we have. There are uh, future work in terms of the coverage or the operational area of every event uh, because sometimes it can have a complex uh, shape sometimes. So with uh, some, some, uh, some kind of future development, we can cover all the events. Then uh, the future work also includes spatial temporal relationships. So I have, uh, I detected first uh, heart attack at the trade mill. Now I'm walking through the chair and I still detect heart attack. But that heart attack detected at the treadmill may be because of the high perspiration and the high, uh, high, uh, high heart rate of a workout. And it was just a five second. I sit down at the chair. I should not detect because there's a spatial temporal relationship. So that can be modeled with some uh, future work. And nowadays the smartphones are uh, being used for being used as a main component or main sensor component for the the cyber physical system and it's not uh, that convenient to attach a sensor mode to the phone so some kind of indoor location algorithm which actually uh, use the, the the cdma or gsm application to find the indoor location can also replace the wireless sensor network based approach so these are some future work i would like to <coughs> end my presentation with uh, uh, expressing my gratitude to all the persons involved uh, for the support, I would like to first uh, 
express my thank and gratitude to Dr. Ratan. Without his help and support, I don't think I'll ever be even complete masters. Uh, he provided so many good, uh, so many uh, life lessons to me, which was not only technical. Dr. Sait, I'm very thankful to him. He introduced me to this whole new domain of semantic web. I was a cold electrical person. The semantic web changed the course of the entire the research. I'd like to thank Dr. Kazmischek, Dr. Subramaniam, and Dr. Zhang, my committee member, for their support, feedback, and comments in my proposal, which actually helped me to uh, get a new direction for my research. I would like to thank my colleague, Nick Bain and Gandhi, in a sensor, sensor lab we have. It was a fun time working with you guys, all the experiments and all the nights we spent in the lab. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Prasad, uh, Corey Hansen, Pramod, and Sujan at the, the sensor, uh, Semantic Sensor Web Lab in Novasis. Uh, you, they, though they provided so many good comments and feedback, like my my research kind of upgraded every time we had discussion, and I, this this stage is because of all the discussion we had. And I would like to end with uh, the ultimate persons, my mom, dad, and my wife. Uh, I cannot do anything without them because I need their support and their patience towards finishing this effort. And I would like to open the floor for questions. Okay. I would like I finish something. Now it's your turn. Question. Um, yeah. What are the advantages of using a Bacon listener as system and tracking versus just maintaining a track or maybe mapping the environment? Okay, uh, so uh, in, in our approach, we were dealing with the small scale objects like a mobile platform or a patient or a person. So when you're when you work dealing with uh, smaller objects, you need very accurate localization because if my my error in a localization is 20 centimeter, 30 centimeter, my robot may be there, but you know the the error will provide it here. So we need a very accurate system. The TDOA based approach provided us two to four centimeter accuracy, which is very very accurate for indoor localization. So that's the main reason we choose TDOA based algorithm to have that two to four centimeter accuracy because uh, you know, the robot can be like 20 by 20 by 20, and then. Uh, with 30 meter the 30 centimeter error, you know it can be somewhere else instead of pointing out over there. So that's the main reason we use uh, TDOA. Uh, couple of questions and some observations, if you mind. Uh, first question is: You talk about handling uncertainty with a fuzzy approach. Yes. From what I saw, okay. the localization approach you had depended on knowing what objects were in the environment. Right. So how would you handle an uncertainty of what objects are in the environment or is there, does firemen uh, frequently unknown. run into errors in what's going to be in the environment? Uh, so you're talking about uh, unknown sources Right? Well, unknown sources which are not modeling the domain knowledge, right? right. Yeah, unknown entities in the object or and, objects in and, the And uh, are you are you asking that like how would I model them or how would I ignore or avoid them in the robot path? So no, the location path, if your question is like with the related with the location, I would say the where the operator who is trying to handle the mobile robot, uh, like uh, that's a question uh, with the with the location. Uh, there can be some system of the mobile robot to avoid this unknown thing which are not model in the situation awareness context like <coughs> situation awareness if you if you're asking my question like how would you deal with this uh, unknown uh, unknown uh, sources in the environment mm -hmm. so the unknown sources uh, may affect this uh, range significantly sometimes sometimes not significantly now as i said the range i received that 800 to 1200 is obtained from a domain expert. And domain, ex domain expert have received that from his experience or statistical analysis. And that's not scope of the research. Now, uh, if the domain expert say, you know, this house may have so many people and the range won't increase in your application, I can go ahead and increase this range according to how domain expert say. So to handle uh, this, uh, the number of people or like, so when there are so many people, they in, in, uh, in do, uh, exhale lots of carbon dioxide. If there is one people, one person, 
he may not introduce that much carbon dioxide, so my range can be uh, little small. But as we know, we don't know. <coughs> so it's all, all <coughs> upon the domain expert how he provide me these fuzzy ranges. Like so if so your system is basically, for example, with your chair burning, for example, um, the materials that the chair is made of are obviously going to affect the combustion. Yeah. And so the system has to know those kinds of things in yeah. order to, uh, so, to operate. Yeah, so actually, the, 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 as richer domain knowledge you have, a more accurate and efficient result you will achieve. Like if you know what are type of wood the chair has and if there are some kind of other flammable material inside the room or the building, you know, you, your model can change accordingly. accordingly. Does your model have the capability to handle inconsistencies in the data? So from the sensors? From the sensors or from the domain knowledge. If you, if, if, if you had something that said this was constructed in such a way. So, so this is the part where uh, if you find out something from, the, from, your, from your application, you find out there are something else. In that case, you have to dynamically update the model, right? Right. So that's actually uh, a, a task being handled right now by the semantic web community, how to dynamically like use machine learning or something to model the thing you identify and then use it back to change right. the that's, that's, that's Yeah, so no, ask. that's not the part of the model. Okay. That's actually a uh, very good research domain. Uh, yeah, yeah, the the idea of having feedback from Feedback yeah, from your model into the domain thing is is a is a key yeah. aspect of yeah because yeah, the other the observation I was to make I I do a lot of work in situation awareness we define situation awareness in the arena I come from uh, quite differently from how you do you're it, it, from my, our perspective you're looking what you're defining is event awareness whereas we define we define situation awareness as as comprised of three things. One is perception, perception event, comprehension, and projection. Yes. So actually, I'm starting with the perception part, yes. and then comprehending the situation, right. and then providing it to the operator, and operator operator can take the, the right. necessary step for the projection. So the right. projection component, it's not covered, because what we are assuming that the operator uh, has the comprehended events and now he can take right. on the next step according right. to yeah, what that, And uh, you're doing really excellent work in the, the place right now in the basic essay world is in the perception part of things. The comprehension field, which is one of the areas you're attacking, is in drastic need of a great deal of support. So I, I salute you for that. Thank you. I think Doctor. I just had a couple of clarification questions. So if you're modeling this room, Okay. And uh, this is the layout of the room. Okay. Um, the question that he asked was, why don't you map it ahead of time with the coordinates? What's just you, so you gave a reason of uh, why. So the question is now, if the room changes, the layout changes, and, or in a house, things just change dynamically. Uh, at my house, things change. Yeah. My so, yeah. So, so oh, oh, okay. the question is different. So um, in that case, first, how, would you, how quickly does the, uh, the RSS approach uh, or the wireless sensor network approach, tackle that. And if one of or one or more of the beacons actually were failing or they were, uh, there was an issue with those, how, how does that affect uh, your actual um, uh, wireless sensor the modeling of this new layout? Yeah. So I, I think uh, you know the answer. So the, the other reason we use this, uh, up, uh, the, we propose this indoor location algorithm to deal with the thing where when you have a person walking inside the room, and so there are, some un, like again the unknown obstacles which are which are uh, which may block the line of sight between them. We needed some approach which which will do this training of radio signal strain and find this loss factor. So the, the loss factor is actually the function of all the radio frequency strain you keep receiving. So you have dynamic environment and so many people are walking. Your loss factor will increase a little bit, and which will actually help. Uh, so what will happen when you have the loss factor? You use that loss factor and use an equation with the re received signal strength, and it, it gives you the distance. So more people and more objects which are blocking the RF or the line of sight, your loss factor increase according to this uh, training. And this training actually is quick because uh, in a second, a in a second, there are like a six times the entire circulation of the beacon complete. So uh, I would say that in a second, six times your uh, all this uh, training algorithm, it's finished updating or populating is stable. So uh, every second you have uh, 
other results. So suddenly, if so many people started walking, your, your algorithm will update this loss factor and apply it for identified distance. So that's like a continuously updating. It's not one-time process. So the loss factor, when no, nobody is moving, the loss factor will be fixed, same, because there is no obstacles for RF. But if you have dynamic environment, the loss factor will keep changing according to the moving of the objects. The second question was if one of or two of the regions were failing. Yeah. How do you, because that will lead to the missing data or some, yeah. some, some dynamic change yeah. of so, the data inaccuracy or inconsistency? Yeah. So uh, in our approach, we need a minimum uh, four, four beacons to complete a position, uh, uh, like a position calculation. So till four, we uh, like till, so. If the beacon fails, it will really affect the, the loss factor calculations. And yeah, the accuracy will, will deteriorate, deteriorate because of the, the, we don't have enough RF samples to find the loss factor. But like, yeah, we are not handling that, uh, the data loss uh, uh, thing right away. Yes. Uh, so you have certain level of uh, degree of certainty of any event, right? So let's say there is an event happening and uh, let's say there is a fire in the location, the uh, membership function is on 0 0.9, say. Okay. And uh, for that number to be achieved, it requires an amount of iterations. The algorithm will go through a few iterations. So, so is there a minimum number of iterations that has to, yeah, no. to, to achieve a certainty? Or? So we, we are not going through iterations actually. So it's like a one-time process. You, you receive <coughs> the sensor data. Now, the, the event is not fuzzy. The event is certain, there will be fire or no fire, but the abstractions, which is say high temperature and the low temperature, they have fuzzy range actually. So it's a one time process, you get the temperature, you find out which fuzzy range it is in between, or if, what is the certainty of that abstraction, use these rules, and with that rules you say, okay, now there's fire. So every time you receive, it, it complete and give you uh, events with certainty. Yes. You use the term certainty when you're talking about fuzzy. Um, did you look at things like dumpster shaper uncertainty theory or Bayesian belief networks as a, alternate ways to model those? Yeah, so uh, so the, the one of the so I was going through this uh, uh, some papers which actually explain uh, why where to use fuzzy and where to use Bayesian. So Bayesian is more about uncertainty in the knowledge, and we are dealing with uncertainty in the truth. Well, that, that's why I asked about them for sure. Yeah. So we theory. are dealing with the truth because you know, the fire will be. Uh, uh, so because the truth is like the concept, con concept of high carbon dioxide and low carbon dioxide. <coughs> so that's why we choose the fuzzy. Right. Uh, but I guess the Bayesian has a similar, similar thing, like the approach of modeling. Yes. So for if it's with the knowledge, we can deal with. It. But, but as I said, when when we deal with fuzzy, we tend to talk more as you did when you mentioned you, you talk about membership mm -hmm. and being rather than degree of truth. Degree of truth is something you talk about more when you're talking about something like Dempster Shaper uncertainty theory where you have degrees of certainty, degrees of truth, mm -hmm. which go from zero to one. You're talking mm -hmm. about inductive reasoning instead of deductive reasoning. Deductive. Yep. Okay. Uh, anybody else? <laughs> your chance now. <coughs> Ask no? hard questions. Nick, you have a question? No. No? Okay. <coughs> All right. Future uh, PhDs, right? <laughs> All right. Let's give him a hand then.